Okay, good afternoon, or good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are today. And welcome to today's webinar, Sign Here, the Business Case for Digital Signatures, brought to you by AIM, the Enterprise Content Management Association, in conjunction with Barclay Blair, Barclay Blair of SES Information Governance. Now, today's webinar is underwritten by our platinum sponsor today, ARX. <coughs> Excuse me. A few words about AIM before uh, diving into the content uh, of, of today's webinar. Uh, we are an excellent place to start if you've got issues around managing uh, information. Uh, I direct you to both of the URLs before you if you want to get basic information about enterprise content management and all the issues and strategies and technologies uh, therein, uh, www.aim.org. Uh, if you'd like to participate in conversations with your peers, uh, informationzen.org is a great place to um, uh, do so. Uh, today's webinar is about digital signatures, often the last mile to uh, making a process entirely digital uh, involves involves taking excuse me involves taking out a wet signature out of the process uh, having undergone just undergone a, a mortgage application and, and purchasing a house. Uh, I feel the pain that uh, this webinar seeks to solve, and we hope you um, after the webinar concludes, I believe you walk away with a sense that uh, the use of digital signatures uh, there is a there is an ironclad business case um, both uh, both from an ROI perspective as well as a legal perspective uh, for moving forward with using digital signatures. I'll pull up our uh, AIM education slide for you to view as I go over session logistics today. Uh, so uh, those of you who have joined us before, um, this might be familiar to you. Uh, just note, begin by saying, save your eyes. Uh, please note there is an enlarged slide button on the screen. Uh, use that. Um, we recommend also that you disable any pop-up blockers for best performance. Uh, also, if you notice for some reason that the slides are no longer advancing during today's webinar, uh, please refresh your br uh, browser. Um, Either action generally solves about 99% of our audience viewing issues. Uh, if you have any other issues, there is a submit questions button. Uh, part of our Q, uh, part of our webinar today is a, a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Um, obviously, use that to submit questions throughout the hours. They come to you for uh, for questions for both of our speakers today. Um, also, you can use that you can use that submit questions button to ask us any. Excuse me. Ask us any questions you have about the uh, uh, logistics aspects of things as well. Uh, you can also download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll push out a survey link on your screen. Please take a few moments to complete it. To complete it, let us know how we did today and suggest future topics for us to cover. As an editor, I find that to be an invaluable source. So if you could take a take a few moments, uh, that that helps us out a lot. Uh, also, a final note, if you should have to leave the presentation early, wish to listen to it again, or know of a coworker who has need of this knowledge, uh, we do archive all of our webinars. Um, it's uh, www.aim.org, uh, AIM, uh, excuse me, webinars, and there's an archive link there. Um, uh, we have about 70 or 80 up right now. Uh, this one will be available for replay by Friday at the latest. Now let me go over the AIM housekeeping slides before introducing our speakers and turning it over to them. Um, AIM is an excellent source of education and training uh, in the uh, enterprise content management industry. Uh, you see the six major areas of emphasis for training before you. Uh, the AIM certificate program is the leading training program in document and records management. Uh, it's over over 7,000 course attendees. Actually, that number is over 10,000 now uh, in two years. Uh, classes are available as online courses, scheduled public courses, or private in-house courses on request. Uh, for more information, uh, visit the URL before you. If you're interested in online training but only have a few hours to commit, uh, then consider the AIM Essentials courses. They're on a variety of topics. Uh, they last about five hours total, and they offer a solid overview of the topics um, uh, appearing before you. Uh, new essentials are regularly added, so check back. Find one that's right for you. And before turning it over to Barkley, allow me to introduce our speakers uh, in reverse order. As mentioned, our, our, our uh, presentation today is in three parts. Uh, we'll have Barkley Blair speak first, followed by John Marcioni of ARX, and conclude, as I mentioned, with questions from all of you. Uh, I'll introduce uh, John first, who is speaking after Barkley. Uh, John Marcioni is Vice President of Business Development for ARX. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in U.S. and international high technology markets uh, related <clears throat> excuse me, related to technology and intellectual property licensing. Uh, he was uh, appointed the Visiting Scholar Associate for Inform Informatics at UC Berkeley from 2004 to 2006. 
and is a member of the Security Council of the Gerson Lehrman Group. He's a frequent speaker, and he's got some he's got some actually some interesting uh, information as well. Uh, of course, first up is our speaker featured speaker today, uh, Barkley Blair. He is director and practice lead for SCS Information Governance. I've had the pleasure of working with Barkley off and on over the years. He's been a frequent contributor to the magazine and contributes uh, online as well, uh, Infonomics and Infonomics Weekly. Uh, he's a consultant to Fortune 500 companies, uh, software and hardware vendors, and government institutions, uh, author, speaker, and internationally recognized authority on a broad range of policy, compliance, and management issues related to information governance and information technology. Uh, Barkley, take it away. Well, thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, joining us today. So I think I want to spend our time together today really talking about three separate topics. So we'll start with what you see on your screen, which was really a, a, a really quick introduction to the technology and the process behind digital signatures. You know, by virtue of the fact that you're here today, you probably know some of this, so we'll go over it quickly. I won't talk about the technology in depth, but that will give us the foundation to uh, have the rest of our discussion. There's often the, the terms in this space are, are misunderstood, so we'll clear that up. So next we'll talk about um, the business case for digital signatures and talk about where in your institution and what kind of business processes you may want to consider using digital signatures for, where they'll provide the most value uh, in, in where you can manage risk uh, the best using uh, the right selection of signature technology. And then the last part uh, of, of my time, I'm just going to share with you some practical uh, ideas that that I've developed over the years in helping clients uh, look at and, and evaluate and implement digital signatures. So we'll talk about some evaluation criteria and implementation checklists, things you should look at and consider when you are um, building out a signature process or uh, buying uh, technology. You know, as we'll talk about, the, although the law is very friendly towards electronic signatures, much of the heavy lifting is left to us to determine what is the best process and what is the best technology for a given application. So, so let's just start off with talking about what digital signatures are. Now, you know, what's interesting about this discussion is that although in our daily lives most of us use the term electronic and digital uh, interchangeably, in this world, somewhat confusingly, they actually mean different things, and I'll talk about this. But to begin with, I think it's helpful to think about the largest uh, category here that we're talking about being electronic signatures. And digital signatures are actually a type of electronic signature. I'll talk about that in a second. So what is an electronic signature? Well, um, you know, in, in the U.S. and across the globe, there's hundreds of laws and regulations now that provide for or provide a legal foundation for the use of alternatives to manual or handwritten signatures. And most of them have kind of the same uh, thrust, which is that they kind of apply some of the fundamentals of, of signature law or evidentiary law to the digital world. And if you look at this definition from, from ESIN and UEDA, these are the two primary laws in the U.S., ESIN being a federal law, UEDA, which is the uniform Electronic Transactions Act, which is a model law that has been implemented by most of the states, they kind of they define it in effectively the same way. So what is an e-signature? Well, it's almost anything. Here we see a sound symbol or process that's linked to the thing that we're trying to sign, a contract or record. It's the act of a person. So we see the language is executed or adopted by a person with the intent to sign that record. So somehow... It has to capture intent. And this definition is in rocket science, right? If we think about what a handwritten signature is, it, it has all of these things, right? It's a mark of some kind that is attached to you know, the physical qualities of ink on paper to uh, the thing we're signing, and it's an act of a person, and it captures intent. So really, under the law, the definitions are uh, uh, of an electronic signature are pretty straightforward, and kind of analogous to what we've been doing for centuries in the, in the, in the uh, manual signature world. <clears throat> so within this umbrella category of electronic signature, I, I, this is the way that I think of it. There's really three kinds of signatures that we're talking about. There's the generic electronic signature 
There's electronic signatures that have some security features, and then there's digital signatures. So to start off with, a, a generic electronic signature is almost anything, and we've used these uh, probably dozens of times in our daily lives. They're quick wraps that we use to agree to the terms of software, we, the website terms that we agree to when we purchase something online at Amazon or eBay. We use electronic signatures, uh, certainly dim, digitized images of handwritten signatures and so on. So, you know, the, the key here is that we're just talking about the most basic form of signature. It's a mark, it's a symbol, it's something that is designed uh, at some level to indicate our intent to be bound. Now, without any additional security measures, obviously, um, these generic electronic signatures have a fairly low level of security, and that makes them appropriate for trans generally for transactions that also have uh, a lower value, and that's why we see them in, you know, business-to-consumer uh, e-commerce and so on. You know, it's difficult to demonstrate intent. It's difficult to demonstrate, uh, you know, conclusively that, you know, Bryant was the one that ordered the flowers online, but for, for transactions of low value, generally we don't really care about that. So kind of moving up the ladder of security, if you will, there's a family of electronic signatures that have some kind of security feature. So maybe we use biometrics, a fingerprint, for example, or a retina scan or something to bind a person to the signature device or to their signature code and thereby, you know, provide better proof down the road of who signed the actual document. <clears throat> you know, we see in this area there's lots of very creative approaches to to this, you know, adding cryptography, adding, um, you know, smart cards are a good example where there's some unique identifier uh, in, in a chip and a card that can be programmed and, again, tied back to uh, the person actually doing the signature. So uh, electronic signatures with security features are attempting to, you know, add some capability to the signature to allow us to, in the future, you know, defend that and demonstrate who signed what and when. So that brings us to digital signatures, which are actually a specific kind of electronic signature. Now, these use um, some very sophisticated mathematics and cryptography behind the scene to provide a reliable link between someone's actual identity and their digital identity, if you will, and between the uh, act of of uh, signing a document electronically and the document itself. You know, digital signatures are based on uh, industry standards. The, the technology behind them is well understood and accepted, and, you know, the, it's available in most uh, major applications. In some jurisdictions, and for some purposes, digital signatures, this kind of electronic signature actually is afforded or accorded greater legal status and in some cases it's actually required, simply because it provides a higher standard or a higher level of security, authenticity, and some of the other qualities that we're going to talk about when I talk about how to evaluate the best signature type for you. So moving on to the second section, so we talked about how there's different signature types out there and part of the exercise for you is to determine what kind of signature type or signature process is right for you. But in order to, to answer that question, I think we need to first look at why we would want to use these signatures in the first place. And in my mind, at, at least the, the reasons are pretty compelling. You know, I think out of the gate, and, I, and there's, there's four reasons that, that make the most sense to me. You know, out of the gate, I think the first big reason to use uh, electronic or digital signatures is that it really enables that business process to be 100% digital. We all understand inherently, it's kind of self-evident, the value of digital business processes in terms of driving down costs uh, and making things uh, cheaper and making things more convenient and faster. But the reality is, and as Brian said, if you if you've done a high-value transaction of some kind in the last uh, any number of years, 
you probably noticed, of course, that the last mile of that transaction, i.e. the signature process, is, is very commonly still a paper process. So talk about buying a home and we have all of this paperwork, uh, you know, moving from place to place in couriers and mail and fax and the signature process that is occurring in a manual environment. You know, and it's, it's interesting that we've spent in most institutions millions of dollars on sophisticated technology to allow us to, you know, initiate this whole process and manage this whole process electronically, but when it comes to the signature, we're still reverting to uh, a so-called wet signature or a manual signature, and that comes at a cost. I mean, uh, having that manual process at the end of or part of a digital process, according to many estimates, is at least, you know, 10 to $30 per signature, and perhaps even higher than that if you add in the cost of processing and managing and storing the paper related to that, or perhaps of the dual streams of management that you have to undertake when you have part of the transaction electronically and part of it uh, in paper as well. So it's really that last mile of the business process, and in some ways that last mile can be the most challenging but the most rewarding because it really enables us to leverage those investments that we've made in all of this great technology, ECM technology, for example, that allows us to do stuff digitally and to manage our content digitally. It allows us to leverage that investment to make these processes 100% digital. So the second reason why I think digital signatures make sense is because our customers want it. And whether we're talking about uh, business-to-business transactions, you know, high value, maybe even one-off or, or high value but low uh, frequency transactions or the relatively low value but high frequency transactions of business-to-consumer you know, uh, time and time again, studies show and even behavior of consumers show that we want to do this stuff as easily, cheaply, and, and, as, and as conveniently as possible. And, you know, a, again, making a business process 100% digital does just that. It's what our customers want. It's what consumers want. And um, I think it makes real, uh, real sense. You know, digital signatures, and specifically are designed to kind of provide that balance between let's make this easy for our customers to do, but let's make sure that we're protecting their legal rights and protecting our legal rights as well in doing a transaction that uh, meets those standards. That's going to be legally binding. It's going to protect everyone in the transaction. So that technology is available. I think um, customers want it, whether it's the business-to-business or the business-to-consumer context, and that's why uh, it makes sense. You know, we've talked about, about and, and probably we most commonly think of, uh, when we talk about transactions, of externally facing transactions. So from our institution out to a, a customer, whether it's a consumer or another business. But the reality is that so much uh, a benefit can be achieved, both in terms of cost and efficiency and, and speed by enabling internal uh, inefficient business processes to be 100% digital. And so many of those do require uh, signature as part of their process. So um, digital signatures make sense because they allow us to take those processes and make those digital and realize the benefits as a result. You know, so many HR activities like you see on your screen require signatures, certainly the legal process and contract negotiations, regulatory filing that require signatures are still very much paper-bound simply because, in most cases, they haven't implemented that last mile, that, that digital signature. Same thing for many, many financial processes, um, you know, sales, QA, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it makes sense. You know, we look at, you know, today so many large enterprises are, you know, geographically dispersed and, and distributed or decentralized. And yet we continue to cling to these manual paper-based signing processes that are just so inefficient. And, you know, digital signatures provide us with a mechanism to really make those processes fully digital and, and automated. So whether it's, you know, sequential approvals across uh, all of your locations, whether it's dealing with field staff and sales, point of service, et cetera, 
you know, executives and decision makers who are typically because they're on the road a lot and, and yet they're the, the, the primary bottleneck in these approval processes, we can enable that to occur wherever they are and so on. So, so again, you know, digital signatures, they make sense because they allow us to improve these internal business processes and drive down costs, which, of course, is at the top of mind for all of us uh, today in this economy. So the final point, I think, about why uh, digital signatures make sense is simply because the law enables us to do it. You know, the, in, for most purposes in most jurisdictions, digital signatures are entirely acceptable, and that's, and that's globally. You know, there's a big push in the early part of this decade to make that happen, and it largely has. And so that shouldn't be a barrier to the implementation uh, of this technology and of this process. The key is, however, that so if you look at where most disputes occur around signatures, it's rarely to do with the legality of the signature itself. So there's rarely fights over, you know, was this a legal signature or did this comply with the law, the, the mechanism used, but where the dispute most frequently occur is really on the quality of the signature itself. So in some states, for example, I could execute a real estate transaction by sending an email with my, ni my name typed at the end, and that's viewed as a signature, as a binding signature. But is that a high-quality signature? Is that something that is likely to stand up in court if there's a dispute over the identity of the person that signed it, whether or not that was a real document, whether or not my intention was to buy or to sell that piece of real estate and so on. Well, you know, the email is a pretty bad piece of evidence without you know, having any additional security around it. So probably it's not a high-quality piece of evidence, and it's certainly not something that I would rely on to consummate a high-value transaction. So Although the law supports it, the law, like in this area, as in most other areas, generally doesn't prescribe prescribe what we need to do. It doesn't tell us specifically how to comply. So that leaves it up to us, of course, and that can be somewhat of a challenge. So that's why I want to talk about um, how to evaluate and how to, uh, to look at the different options in electronic signatures and make the right choice for your business and make the right choice for the business process that you are trying to enable. So, you know, what's interesting, I think, about this world is that, you know, although, um, you know, digital signatures are relatively new, probably having their origins going back maybe 30 years, of, of course we've been signing documents for centuries, and, you know, current law and practice on digital signatures is so rooted in that centuries of practice, the things that we've learned through the millions of transactions that have, have gone good and the millions that have gone bad over those centuries, and the law, the common law, and the, and the practice and regulation that's developed around that. So, you know, when most lawmakers looked at either adapting current law or uh, implementing new law to deal with electronic signatures, they simply just analogized or they, they based those laws on what we've been doing for centuries in the paper world. So what I found to be the most useful way to understand these technologies and their application is to really look at, well, what were we trying to achieve when we did this on paper, and then how can we achieve that same quality in the digital world? And it's through that lens, I think, that we can understand what we should be looking for when we are moving from a wet signature, a manual signature, to an electronic signature. So you see this graphic here um, is sort of a wheel, I suppose, of these requirements uh, or issues that I really think you need to consider and discuss with your technologists, with your vendors, when it comes time to choose a signature process or choose a signature technology <clears throat> for your business process. So we'll talk about uh, each of these in turn. 
Now, what's interesting, I think, about this world is that often some of these these terms and phrases you saw on the previous slide are, are used interchangeably or at least sort of uttered in the same breath as if they mean exactly the same thing, but they don't. And we'll talk about those terms and, and the specific meaning that they have because the meaning is very important because it, it drives to a requirement that we want to achieve in our technology and in our implementation. So I think the first quality or the first issue you want to look at is authenticity. So in other words, is the signed document authentic? Is it what it purports to be? So is it really from who it says it's from? Was it really created when it says it was created? You know, is it really represent a representation of the business process it purports to be? So authenticity is a key uh, concept under the law and in, in the laws of surrounding evidence. And it's really the, the sum total of a, a, a bunch of qualities that come together in the process to help build authenticity or not. So what you want to look for, right, when you're considering what process or technology to use is the ability to be able to prove that authenticity down the road. You know, a big part of that is that so-called audit trail, or right, the chain of custody, who had access to the document, the signed document, and when. So the first criteria you should be looking at or asking yourself about is authenticity. So how is this process going to provide authenticity for the signed document? Second quality is confidentiality. I think we all understand what this means, but in effect it, it comes down to, you know, protecting information from unauthorized access or unauthorized viewing. And sometimes it's, it's just people that are part of the process but, but only need to see certain information. Sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, traditional uh, protection from uh, those outside, you know, an authorized group, those outside your company, for example. <clears throat> you know, what's interesting about this is, again, remember, we're basing all of this on what we used to do in the paper world, and we understand how to provide confidentiality in the paper world. It's, you know, couriers and locks, <laughs> locks and keys and so on. So... We want to look for those same capabilities uh, in the digital world, and certainly they, are, they do exist uh, in signature technology. So with all of these things, and I'll talk about this, you know, as we wrap up, you have to decide how much of it you need, you know, how much of a concern is confidentiality for a given business process, and how much money and time do you want to spend providing that level of confidentiality. <laughs> Not all transactions have the same requirements, right? Not all business processes have the same requirement. So we have to, you know, implement solutions that reflect those needs. And that need might come from a regulation. It might just come from an internal process, you know, a, a timesheet approval application or an expense reimbursement application. Clearly, as it relates to these qualities, probably has a lower threshold than, you know, a manufacturing process that requires approvals at each stage from multiple vendors or suppliers, right? So the third quality, non-repudiation, which is just a, you know, a big term for a simple concept. So in other words, what we're concerned about is, you know, will the signer be able to claim that they didn't sign the document? In other words, will they be able to repudiate the, the signature? You know, so if you think about the credit card system, it sort of has that mechanism built in, right? The charge back that, oh, I didn't buy those flowers, so I'm not going to pay for them. There's a whole mechanism written into merchant to cardholder agreements in that system to provide and, and uh, address that. Um, in our transactions, we have to decide how much of a concern this is, and if it is a concern, you know, what can we do to prevent it? And a lot of this comes down from, uh, comes down to the, the quality of the entire process that we use. So, you know, each step in the process of signing a document uh, electronically provides an opportunity perhaps for someone to poke holes and say, look, this wasn't me, I didn't intend to do this, I didn't understand what was going to happen, uh, it was altered afterward, and so on. So think of non-repudiation as a quality that comes from really your investment in the other criteria that we've talked about. So the fourth concept is integrity. So 
obviously related, but a different concept than authenticity. So with authenticity, we're worried about provenance and, you know, is the document what it purports to be. With integrity, we're trying to understand whether or not the document was altered in any way after it was signed. So was something added? Was something taken away? Is this actually what the person signed, right? So, again, in the paper world, you know, we've relied for centuries on the physical qualities of, you know, ink on paper to try and safeguard against this, but it's important in, in, this, in the discussion about all these qualities that we have to remember the paper is forged all the time, and actually in many ways it's getting easier and easier as, you know, the sophistication of uh, printing technology that we have in our homes and our offices uh, increases. So, you know, the integrity of the document, you want to be able to demonstrate that what I'm holding up in court and claiming that you signed uh, is actually what you signed. So we want to look for technologies that, that provide that and, and the right level of it for the transaction that we're talking about. You know, intent, I mentioned earlier um, uh, today that uh, often disputes around signatures, particularly those involving a consumer in a business, come down to intent. So um, uh, this is often where um, there's a lot of, a lot of disputes. And, and, and the mechanism that you use to capture intent really has to be built, again, with a view to, in the future, is someone going to try and claim that they, they signed this for a different reason. And, you know, I, I think it's really insightful to think, to think about when you're implementing a signature process why you're actually implementing it because there's, there's different reasons to do it. Sometimes... Yes, it is. I agree to this. Sometimes I'm agreeing to be bound. Sometimes I'm just agreeing that I understand what this thing says. So, you know, the, the intent of the signature and why you're capturing it in the first place is a big part of, uh, should be a big part of your thinking and how you build the process. So signature intent is an important criteria. Permanence, I think we understand that. Um, you know, in certain applications, we obviously need documents around for a long time. Lifetimes, perhaps, and so um, having a discussion with your technologist and with your uh, vendors around, you know, if I sign this document digitally, will I be able to demonstrate, you know, its authenticity, its integrity, uh, the signer's intent, and so the identity of the signer, and so on, you know, 100 years from now, and if so, how do I do that? And, you know, without going into it in great detail, I think this also is an area where digital signatures shine. They're based on well-understood uh, industry standards, and um, there's uh, a, a lot uh, surrounding the way that technology is managed that probably gives you your best shot uh, at being able to do this. Signature linkage, you know, again, we, we talked about this, I, I think, already or, or I brushed on it, that, you know, we want to make sure that the signature can't be taken from one document and applied to another. And simply, certainly in the case of uh, generic electronic signatures, that may be trivial to do. It may not matter for the kind of transactions you're talking about, but it may, and you may want to look for a technology that, that really uh, provides for that. So the final criteria to look for, I think, is, you know, is the document that once it's signed, is it a good piece of evidence? As I said before, you know, most disputes in this area don't come down to the strict legalities, but they come down to what is the quality of the evidence. Can I demonstrate authenticity? Can I prove that it hasn't changed since it was signed? Can I prove that what the person saw when they signed it is what I'm holding up in front of you right now? And so really it's a matter of choosing the right technology for the job. As we talked about at the outset, there's actually many different kinds of technologies that you can choose from. So to wrap up, I just want to talk through a few points um, uh, along an implementation checklist. So uh, things that you should think about as you go along, uh, go along this process. So, you know, first, you know, which documents in the process really need to be signed and why are you signing them? You know, are, are you simply signing them because that's the way you've always done it? Are you signing them because legally there is a, there's a real need for it? Are you signing it because a regulator is telling you that you have to? You know, really examine the reason why you're getting a signature in the first place because there's a cost to everything, right? So think about if, you know, what is the signature buying you and what does it cost you in terms of uh, time and, 
and money in the process itself. So ask yourself that question first. I think, you know, you want to look at um, every transaction or every business process through the lens of value and risk. So what value is this transaction providing to us or providing to our partners, and what is the risk of that transaction going awry? And based on those two criteria, you can make a good decision about how much time and effort you want to put into the signature piece, into the process itself. Related to that is, you know, a major factor in actually determining risk is the nature of the relationship amongst the parties, right? So typically internal transactions, you know, approval of an extensive reimbursement form or whatever it might be, certain HR transactions, you know, benefits and enrollment and so on, may have less risk than those amongst strangers, right, to business partners who've never really done business together. And I actually thought that a, a, a nice kind of guide, and you won't have time to read this, but you can take a look at it after the presentation, was something that the federal government actually produced around uh, the time that they uh, uh, passed the ESIGN Act. Uh, this actually comes from um, uh, the Office of Management and Budget, um, and it's a guide to assessing the risk associated with the transaction. So you see along the top we've got level of risk, relationship, the value, and then the future need for a good piece of evidence. So if you just look at the top, you say, well, low risk is transactions where it's inside the agency itself, and then value is there's no funds, there's no there's uh, other uh, there's no financial or legal liability involved. And then the lowest risk is where the information related to that transaction is never really going to be referred to again. So you can just see on down the scale, I think it's a really good model for you to think about this problem when you're assessing the value and assessing the risk of transactions and processes and then choosing the right signature process. So a final few points on the implementation checklist. Obviously, you want to look at your technical needs. Um, you know, you've probably already invested a lot of time and money in, in some of these processes, uh, whether it's, you know, your ECM system, you know, contract management, other things, and you want to make sure that your technology that you, you buy, you implement uh, to do the signatures can sit on top of that well and, and integrate well with that. Um, you know, five, determine your cultural needs. You know, this goes for pretty much any question in this space, in the ECM space, which is, you know, what, you know, what, where is the dial set at your at your company or institutional culture on questions of risk? If you're very risk averse, you probably want to look at you know te technologies that provide a really high level of each of those qualities we talked about. You know, non repudiation, integrity, authenticity, and so on. If if uh, if your culture is willing to accept some more risk, then perhaps you know technology that signature technology that provides um, a lower level in some of those areas will be fine. Obviously, work with your legal department. Um, fairly straightforward. There's, you know, don't make sure you understand if there's any uh, specific regulations for you. There's some, uh, certainly if you're FDA regulated and other regulators have um, yeah, signature requirements. Um, even in the HR space, you know, I did a big project for a client where there's some variance among state law in how uh, things like pay stubs, are signed, and so there's some gotchas there that you have to be a little careful of, but you can work with your legal department to do that. And then just make sure you revise and, and, and review your approach uh, over time because legal requirements change, uh, applications change, and the needs of the business change. So, um, so what I've tried to do is give you a grounding sort of in what some of the technology options are when it comes to digital signatures. We talked about why you might want to implement this technology and the value that it can provide. I mean, the bottom line is, look, you know, we spent all this money on automating our business, and, you know, why do we continue to rely unnecessarily on this wet signature process? There's no need to in most applications. There's absolutely no need to. It just adds cost, slows things down, and, and, and doesn't allow us to, to uh, leverage the value that we've, we've built into those systems. Then we talked about some of the, issues you should look at when you're evaluating your approach to uh, electronic and digital signatures. So uh, back to you. Bye.
Thanks, Barkley. And now for a few words from John Marchione. I uh, got that pronounced right this time, John, um, with our uh, sponsor today, ARX. John? Uh, uh, thanks, Barkley. And uh, that, that was uh, um, uh, good, good to sit through. And, and hello, everybody. And thanks, Brian. Um, so uh, the, the agenda for my piece um, is uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of ARX and uh, our Cosine Digital Signature Solution. I'm going to talk a bit about um, two case studies uh, where Cosine uh, has been used to deploy uh, automated uh, approval and author authorization uh, systems within business processes, and I'll quickly go through a demo uh, of, of the solution. Um, so uh, ARX has been in this business for uh, quite some time, uh, you know, we've been dedicated to bringing useful um, digital signature solutions uh, to business where the signature solution uh, is, is viewed as a productivity tool, uh, not so much as a security mechanism, but first and foremost, uh, a mechanism by which businesses can reduce their bottom line operating costs and also accelerate the velocity at which they're doing business because they can be fully automated. Um, key features or aspects of the Cosign solution uh, are easy integration with your electronic content management or workflow solution, especially uh, SharePoint. We have quite a few deployments with, uh, with the SharePoint solution. Uh, Cosign is an all-in-one solution providing you uh, built-in management for the digital identities and certificates as well as uh, centralized management of the keys. These are essentially your signature credentials. Uh, which are managed from a single network attached appliance. Uh, this also makes the solution very quick to deploy and uh, uh, gives you minimal ongoing administrative uh, management burden uh, because Cosign is essentially driven through your pre-established user management system and uh, is also driven uh, by your pre-existing user management and authentication policy. Um, Cosign is a secure, standard, and compliant solution, allowing your business process uh, to uh, stay under your control, um, providing uh, um, audit efficiency that also allows you to reduce your uh, uh, cost burdens associated with coming into compliance with various regulations. Uh, Cosign supports multiple applications, um, which uh, um, include most of the common content authoring applications that you already have on your desktop, for example, Microsoft Office or various applications from Adobe or IBM. Um, Cosign also provides graphical signature features uh, so that um, uh, the user has something kind of warm and fuzzy, something they're familiar with uh, and in the form of a visual graphical signature. And uh, Cosign uh, allows one to easily lay in a sequential signer capability. So within a workflow, this is very important as you may have requirements for signing documents in sequence. Um, uh, you know, speaking to the point uh, as to our leadership in this market, uh, we have deployments worldwide, uh, mainly in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, Two million plus users now using the product uh, with well over 400 million signatures uh, to date on Cosign. Um, the first uh, case study uh, is related to a HR outsourcing company called Maxima. Uh, this company uh, does um, uh, human resource screening and processing for various um, agencies and large companies. Um, they uh, had a, an I-9 processing service that was essentially paper-based. It was a struggling service. Um, it was a, a money loser um, because it was so paper intensive, uh, very low profit or no profit in terms of operation. Um, a couple of things that um, uh, that, that they that changed. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the legislation that uh, Barclay referred to uh, paved the way for them to go completely electronic in processing uh, these online transactions. And uh, Cosign allowed them to digitize the entire process end to end um, in a way that they could uh, maintain a tight control over, and uh, of course have their, their durability of audit uh, uh, after the fact. Uh, 
the impact of of uh, completely automating with cosine was, of course, decreased processing time and cost, um, uh, and reducing uh, postage costs um, and paper handling for over six hundred thousand forms a year. Uh, this also uh, helped them reduce their full-time employee uh, cost for ver the verification process associated with this service. Uh, and uh, it also gave them a competitive advantage in this uh, niche. Uh, it drove their customer satisfaction up because the service guarantee, uh, as far as the turnaround time, was greatly reduced. Um, so prior to uh, Cosign, uh, the company was able to process just under 300,000 new hires a year. Today, they're processing well over 600,000 a year. Um, so, uh, uh, again, uh, what, what they were able to do was fully automate this process uh, all the way through to the signature uh, or the uh, approval or acceptance uh, of the transactions that were being signed. Okay. Uh, the next case study is uh, an, an engineering consultancy firm called CPI. Uh, their engineers do on-site quality control, and they must submit signed reports. Uh, their solution is implemented on SharePoint, uh, but prior to co-sign, their field staff were still having to hit the print button, sign these reports manually, and then, uh, of course, recontaminating uh, the process uh, with the thing they uh, uh, wanted to get rid of in the first place, which was the paper. Um, and, of course, they ended up with a, a mixed uh, or dual, dual uh, medium management that Barclay pointed out. It was a half electronic, half paper process. Um, so uh, uh, they uh, decided to uh, deploy Cosign for SharePoint, which uh, provides uh, centralized credential management for both keys and certificates uh, to the users. Um, everything is driven through uh, Microsoft Active Directory as far as how uh, the signature privileges are assigned and when they're taken away. Um, Cosign uh, has become a slave, in this case, to Microsoft Active Directory. Um, and uh, Cosign also provided enhancements uh, that allowed this firm to not only sign Microsoft content under SharePoint, but also digitally sign, sign non-Microsoft content, specifically PDF and PDFA documents, um, uh, which uh, are in many cases, a preferred uh, archiving format. Um, uh, PDF uh, is, is considered more of a standard, more durable for long-term archive. And then finally, Cosign provides a way to quickly uh, assign an entire document library or a document list and also view the signature status uh, uh, just by looking at a list of documents under this particular workflow ECM. You don't have to open each document individually to see what the status of the signature is, but you can quickly eyeball a list and then off to the side see what the signature status is. It's either been signed, it's, it's still uh, unsigned, or um, the signature is, is marked invalid because there's been some tampering with the document. Um, so the, the impact for CPI was, of course, eliminating the last of their paper, um, uh, turning uh, a delayed process into an instant reporting process. Uh, this allowed for tighter collaboration with their customers uh, and and uh, a, a very clear, and as in, as, as in the last case study, a very clear and measurable return on investment. Uh, in this case, uh, under four months, the Cosign solution has paid for itself. Uh, John, let me just pop in here real quick. I know you've got a number of slides here for the demo. If you could just buzz through them real quick that, so we can get to the Q&A, that would be great. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So, so real quickly, um, just, just so you know, Cosign is a universal signature solution. You can sign any document um, practically that you can think of um, uh, within the document context. This one happens to be uh, an engineering drawing in PDF. The way this works is the user will click a sign button, uh, they will be prompted uh, with an identity challenge to tell me who you are. And they will answer the identity challenge uh, uh, if, if they do answer it correctly. Their unique 
digital signature uh, will be made on this document using their credentials. In this case, it's a uh, private key, a standard digital certificate, and this engineer's uh, seal, uh, along with his graphic signature image, are instantly applied to the document. Now you have a signed record that, that any buddy can examine uh, by right mouse clicking and clicking the validate button and inspect this document for proof of the signer's uh, identity, proof of uh, the signer's um, intention, uh, and proof that the document um, was not tampered with since it was signed. So uh, very good, but also the basic mandatory features uh, for supporting any sort of auditing or inspection process on an electronically signed document. Uh, so proof of identity, intent, and integrity. And just speeding along here, um, here are some examples of uh, companies that have deployed CoSign uh, uh, pretty much across uh, any vertical you can think of. Um, uh, uh, there, there are CoSign deployments today. And, and with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll reserve the rest of the time here for the Q&A. Okay, thanks, John, and thanks, Barkley, uh, for uh, for your time and insights here. Let me get to the questions. Actually, before getting to the questions, I'm sorry, uh, just to everyone out there, if you'd take a few moments to answer the uh, survey that will be appearing there in a moment, um, that will be great. Oh, well, let's see if I can push the right buttons here and get it out to everyone. Okay, there we go. should be popping up in your audience view. Uh, either cut and paste that into a browser or go ahead and uh, click on the link. Okay, lots of questions to get through here and keep sending them in. We'll uh, get through as many as we can today, and we'll try to get some of them answered offline for you as well and create an article article for this uh, um, uh, to include in, on the Antronomics website. Um, sorry, hit refresh. Uh, there, were, there were two or three questions about uh, Barclay, and, and then, uh, John, I like your opinion on this as well. Uh, how do you implement this type of process uh, if you don't have an enterprise content management or enterprise document management system? Is that possible? Sure, you can sign documents and email them around. Uh, yeah, and we've also seen uh, customers simply use a file system. Um, so uh, the, the key is uh, really the document management or automated workflow, uh, which could be uh, more complex to lay in, um, could be done at a later date. Um, and uh, as long as you have a content authoring application, Content authoring means you have Microsoft Office or one of the Adobe products to make something, to make the electronic form. Uh, this, this can be good enough. The, the other thing we've observed in some of our customers is they've actually started with the signature solution first, found out how documents move uh, through their organization in an ad hoc way, uh, before they make the investment in the ECM or automated workflow. So in other words, the, by laying in the digital signature solution first, they've actually learned more about how their business process works before going to the bigger investment of laying in an automated workflow or ECM solution. Okay. Uh, one, one other question for you, uh, uh, John, uh, which uh, just popped down to the thought of my queue. Apologies here, folks. Um, there was a question about the when you're going through the Microsoft um, uh, case study, is there a way to sign multiple forms by simply clicking one button? Uh, yes, we have uh, um, uh, a batch sign utility. Um, so you can, you, you can sign a whole list of documents um, at, at once under SharePoint. Um, and if you're not using SharePoint, uh, we also have another uh, utility um, that's referred to as the batch sign utility. So okay. If yes, on both counts, inside and outside of uh, SharePoint. Okay. Uh, Barkley, there was a question about um, uh, that came in early that I forwarded to you uh, last week about archiving. Um, uh, what are the implications for digital signatures uh, of digital signatures for long-term and or archival documents uh, where the signatures must be proven to be authentic and accessible over time, potentially for hundreds of years in some cases? Yeah, you know, I think from a high level, um, you know, the, the basic concept is that you need to archive the signature material you know, quote unquote, um, for the same length of time as the document itself. Um, 
uh, needs to be archived or, or demonstrably signed. Um, and it, to my knowledge, the best method of doing that is really using the digital signature technology, um, um, you know, which provides for uh, that capability, and it's sort of built into the, the infrastructure side of, of public key infrastructure to allow archiving um, of that material so you can demonstrate its about viability in the future. Okay. Uh, are there any concerns, uh, uh, not concerns, but is, is there any perspective uh, uh, from the ARX side uh, on that question, John? Uh, yeah. Um, essentially, uh, this is the only standard for electronic signatures. So um, if you are going to deploy a digital signature solution and you have or an electronic signature solution, you have any near-term or long-term retention requirements, uh, it's in your best interest to pick a standard technique, and that's what COSIGN implements. The digital signature technique is a standard and peer-reviewed, um, and there's another advantage here. If uh, the vendor you buy from happens to go out of business uh, because it's a standard, somebody will always be able to reproduce the verification process so you can pull those records 100 years from now because they follow the standard um, uh, you will be able to recalculate the verification on those records, where if you're doing something that is from a single vendor, proprietary, um, not only should you have security concerns about the viability or how secure that signature is, as Barclay pointed out earlier, but you sh you're, you're also going to have a set of records that may very likely not be verifiable into the future. A uh, question for you, Barkley. Um, uh, how do automated processes prove intent of signature? Or wouldn't it be fair to say that in the case of high-volume automated processes, the integrity of the process itself is more important than the actual signature technology? In which case, what what are the guidelines for implementing those types of processes? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a fair point. I think I think all of this, all the discussion we're having um, inherent to the discussion is that. You know, you don't implement signature technology in a vacuum. You implement it as part of the process. And, you know, the, the quality of that process, uh, including the signature technology, basically adds up to um, uh, the, the sum of uh, uh, evidentiary quality of the documents themselves. So, um, you know, the components, you know, including the, the workflow um the, the design of the documents or the forms themselves, the, the, the way the data from the forms and documents are stored, um, the way the, the signature event is presented to the signer, um, as well as the signature technology all work together to be able to demonstrate intent and, and provide non-repudiation. Um, so, I mean, it's a complex question in terms of, you know, there's no right answer in terms of what is the right process in every case, but, you know, suffice to say that I think every process needs to be developed with that in mind so that um, look at it through the worst possible light that in the future, where are the points in this process where there could be a dispute or an objection? You know, was it the size of the font in the form? Was it the language in the form? Was it the signing technology used? Was it the way that the signed form was uh, maintained post-signature um, and all of those things really uh, uh, add up um, to provide that quality. Okay. Uh, so there's a question that I'm trying to find here at the, uh, that was uh, uh, regarding global uh, issues. Is digital signatures just uh, just uh, viable in the U.S., or is it viable in um, uh, uh, other areas of the world as well, uh, John? Uh, yeah, actually, it, it's even more so viable in the EU because the EU directive for electronic signatures actually mandate uh, the deployment and use of a standard digital signature without saying exactly that. But if you look at the parameters that the EU uh, states have agreed on or the attributes that your signature must have, really the only option that can fulfill that uh, is a standard digital signature. And then, of course, if, if you look at this along longitudinal, uh, so if you think of uh, Europe in the north and uh, EMEA in the south below Europe, they typically follow uh, what the Europeans do as well as in the Austral Pact and even the A 
Asia Pac parts of the world. In the U.S., along longitudinal, typically Latin America follows what the U.S. is doing. Okay. So glo- globally, um, uh, there's by- good viability here for digital signatures. And even in the Great White North, eh, Barkley? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Let's uh, let's just ask a question about um, uh, given today's economy, even though it seems to maybe be turning around. Um, uh, the cost of digital signature licenses uh, on a per signer basis was a hindrance back in 2001 when I last looked at this technology. Has that pricing been simplified on a cost licensing process? And what is the price range for digital signatures nowadays? And 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 Barkley, I'll let you take that, and then John, I'll let you have the last word on that particular question. Um, actually, I'll just turn that one over to John. I think he's uh, the best one to answer that question. Okay. Um, yeah, t- typically um, uh, what was happening in 2001 is that the vendors were taxing uh, the user um, for the digital certificate, meaning uh, for every uh, digital uh, signature user, you had to buy a digital ID from a third party, um, which would require that you pay them every year. Under the cosign approach, we're selling a solution where the company or the individual themselves can essentially uh, manage their own digital identity. Uh, typically, it's, it's in the enterprise or the business. Uh, uh, the whole idea behind cosign is we're selling you an enabling solution. We're not going to tax your business. You buy a solution. You manage your own certificates and identities, um, and it's it's a one-time fee. So you're buying a solution that you own, and the more you use it, the more you're going to save. Not so with the old model, where the more you use it, the longer you use it, the more you would pay year after year. Um, so uh, on, on average, uh, for, for a single cosign user, it's a $50, $50 one-time fee is what we charge. Um, and uh, this is why our customers get such a rapid return on investment. Uh, and this keeps our customers in control because instead of farming out credential and ID management to a third party, they keep it under their control, under their umbrella. After all, the business is going to have all the liability in the end for how well their business process is managed. They cannot, even if they farm out certificate management, they cannot offload the liability to a third party. So why, why farm it out? Why offload it? Uh, when you don't get anything extra in terms of liability protection and you're, you're paying more besides. So the cosine philosophy is bring it in-house, manage okay. it yourself, and so on. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just ask you, too, one final question, then I'll, then I'll wrap up here. And if you were just to leave, uh, leave our audience today with one, one essential thing to walk away from, uh, in 30 seconds or less, John, what would that be? Um, Get you know, you know get get rid of the last of your paper. Um, uh, this, this can be done, um, especially in, in 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 this current economy. I don't think we can afford paper intensive processes. Okay, so uh, it, it, as much as you can, and, and you don't have to necessarily lay in a complex document management system to do this. But uh, you have you've already made your investment in the content authoring application, the Microsoft Office, or the Adobe. If you've made bigger investments in ECM, fine. But uh, complete that last uh, mile, or or take that drive up the driveway uh, into the living room now, and go completely paperless. Maybe it's not even a mile you're covering; it's less than a mile. And a digital signature with cosign will allow you to complete your investment and business process automation in a very affordable way with a quick, quick return on investment. Okay. And Barclay? Yeah, I would say just, you know, step back and look at the process of the transaction you're trying to, you know, make 100% digital and and really assess what the value and risk of that transaction is and then make a good choice around uh, the process and the technology you're going to use to enable digital signatures. I think that's the right way. I mean, if there's there's, there's great technology, there's great processes, but, you know, choose the right uh, mix for uh, the process that you're trying to enable. 
Okay. And I think with that, uh, again, thanks to all of you out there, and thank you for your great questions. Uh, we'll get to, we'll answer as many of those as we can in our online article, either with, with Barkley and some other folks, uh, folks that asked a question directly of, uh, directly related to ARX. Um, we'll get those questions to, uh, to John and the folks at ARX and get answers to you as well. Uh, see you back next week, October 21st, uh, and on when we turn discussion to software as a service, uh, cloud computing. And as always, uh, thanks to Barkley Blair for his time and expertise from FCS Information Governance, and thank you to our platinum sponsor today, ARX, uh, and John Mar- Marchione for his thoughts. And, of course, as always, thanks to all of you. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh, see you back next week. Have a great day. Uh,